I am a human being and I killed human beings. Before I knew it, I'd fired four shots at the door. I kept on shouting for Reva to phone the police. Tests are underway to determine if a serial killer is on the loose in Centurion, Pretoria. The dead won't bother you. It's the living you gotta worry about. In South Africa, 71 people are murdered every day. These are the stories of the criminals and the people who catch them. My name is Paul Llewell and I'm a journalist and filmmaker curious about Africa's killers, criminals and the cops who catch them. And joining me to discuss crime on the continent, as always, is Jared Labaskachny, the former cop and current head of LNS, th- LNS Threat Management, who led the investigative psychology section of the South African Police Service from 2001 until 2016. In his time there, he worked on over 300 serial murder and rape cases, and he is the profiler. Um, please do visit our YouTube page and subscribe, um, and you can catch us um, wherever you listen to podcasts, I guess. So um, share with your friends and get in touch if there are cases you want us to talk about or um, questions that you have or complaints. Um, well, don't say complaints. If you have compl- whatever you want to share with us, please do. Um, we're always happy to hear your feedback, um, the complaints we ignore. Gerard, how are you? Kidding yourself, thanks. <laughs> I'm great, thank you. <laughs> we don't ignore them. We really don't. We do take everything on board because we value our true crime audience. Um, so, Gerard, today we have a pretty exciting um, show for, um, for one whole reason. Do you know what that one whole reason is? I do indeed. Yes, that one whole reason is Nicole Engelbert, who is the um, host and creator and um, grandmaster of True Crime South Africa, Mm -hmm. um, our most listened to, most wonderful local true crime podcast. Hi, Nicole. Hi, Paul. Hi, Gerard. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Hi, it's so nice to have you here with us um, in this um, unnamed time that we record the show. It could be a bright sunny morning it could be we in the dark hours of the night nobody knows um you of course will be listening to it whenever you want to um we're going to talk about the true crime space today first of all anything going on in your life in the last week gerard that's worth talking about or telling us about uh, not my life personally but of course there's been lots of things happening like the terror threat that was announced by the u.s government which yeah. seemed to have caused a international fracas Uh, between the South African government and the U.S. government. So that's uh, just quite an interesting thing. There is a week or two lag on when we record shows. So this will have been a couple of weeks ago now. But, um, yeah, I mean, I guess we talk a lot about how how really wonderful law enforcement is in South Africa and a wonderful law enforcement system, when being sarcastic, um, invites people who are are looking for an environment where they're not going to be bothered too much by law enforcement, I would imagine. Mm, Yep. Hey? Yeah, uh, these types of things thrive when when they think governments are not thriving. Yes, yes, yes. Crime. This is why we make true crime content because we're in a country that um, that there's a fair amount of crime in. I always say this, you know, if you're in Africa, make shows about lions and elephants and stuff because we've got the best animals in the world and the greatest, you know, wildlife and what have you. But we also have a lot of murderers and horrible people. Um, so crime content makes sense. And that's why I got started. I'm curious, though, um, to know why Nicole got started. Nicole, why did you, how, what got you into this whole kind of fracas in the first place? Mm. Um, I guess it was really just my own interest in true crime, which has been sort of ongoing as long as I can remember. Um, when I decided that I wanted to move away from working for a boss and do something on my own, sort of like a creative entrepreneurship, I, I had been looking for South African true, true, true crime content and not found much that was focused on what we were doing. So, yeah, I guess I decided to create something yeah so I was working for a um, a corporate corporate company a corporate group of companies and that's when I was it was going to actually be structured very differently the podcast was going to be a very small part of of what I was going to do but then the South African public decided differently 
Okay, so what, uh, tell us about that first episode. I mean, what was your, you know, what kind of what? Uh, I'm, I'm just curious to know more about your journey. That's all. So getting getting started, and then, you know, I, I love the fact that you've got a relationship with with uh, Sunday Times Times Live there, and the, that you, your podcast is very much a part of the. You know, what was the kind of trajectory? What were some of the important steps in kind of uh, starting to achieve some success? So. The first, I did the first three episodes before I even sort of announced the podcast or, you know, came up with a channel or anything like that. And it, it was quite a learning curve because I've never done anything vaguely related to podcasting. I've never done, you know, sort of sound production or anything like that. So I had to learn all of that from scratch and uh, did all of that. And put those first three episodes out, and there was I started the Facebook group, which is now sixteen thousand members. And you know there was a little bit of interest, and people were like, "Oh, this is quite cool," you know. And when I go back and I look at those initial posts now, there's you know like four or five reactions on it, and it just started to sort of spiral, um, you know. And I think what I did was I focused more on making the content than actually what how many people were listening so I, I very rarely looked at the stats um you know so it almost felt like I published three episodes closed my eyes and suddenly there were thousands of listeners but of course it wasn't like that um yeah so it was, it was quite a wild ride but um a lot a really steep learning curve not just on the technology side but also on the um, the content side, because I think I went into it with very um, sort of fixed ideas about crime and true crime and all the rest of it. And I had to let a lot of that go and really learn along the way from some of the you know professionals that made contact with me, uh, which was very cool. I was sort of listening with, uh, learning with my audience. I mean, when you started, did you sort of think of it as just as like a hobby that you do on the side? I know that's kind of how we originally kind of, Paul and I looked at this, you know, great if it goes somewhere, but we just felt like doing it. So was it really as a hobby that then developed into kind of a career? Because this is kind of your life now, isn't it? The, the, the true crime world, not necessarily just the podcast. Mm, yeah, absolutely. So initially I did not for a minute think that it would be what it was, what it is today. It was going to be, I would say a hobby. But I knew that there was that there was opportunity. I, I could see what the podcast overseas were doing. So I knew that it, there was a possibility. I just had no idea how to, you know, make it from that A to that B. Um, you know, so I really did think it was going to be years and years and years of hard slog till it even cracked maybe a thousand listeners. Mm. You know, so yes, it, it probably was going to be a hobby, but it has become, you know, it's, it's spiraled. It's, into other opportunities, into now a book, and it, it pretty much has become the entirety almost of what I do. Mm. And I sometimes think it's actually good not to do too much research into how to do it, because I think then you don't break new ground. And sometimes that naivety, if you think of like a lot of big businesses, afterwards the, the, the guys who started these huge businesses up would say, like, we were really naive, we just thought this is going to happen or that's going to happen. But I think that's sometimes that allows you to bring that new energy and new ideas yet if you just listen to what everybody else says about doing a podcast you'll probably have something that is no different to, to what everybody else is doing and that's not really how you i guess you really become successful you do it by perhaps naively trying to do something different that a lot of people might have advised you don't do it like that and then you end up actually doing it your way and it's it's really successful that's it. i think what's interesting that what's worth pointing out though is that to me it's a combination of things first of all nicole has done the one thing that i've been bad at which is be is maintaining the consistency because my role in our podcast is to maintain the consistency and i should have been because we've been distracted by other crime media endeavors um that's been an issue nicole has had a combination of great content being consistent mm -hmm. and regular so that her audience really kind of grow to trust and know you know what the you know you, you have a it's a it, it's a part of your weekly schedule a podcast mm. isn't it for a lot of people so you kind of want to rely on the fact that on a certain day you can count on the fact that that there's going to be a fresh piece of content to keep you interested but then the other thing i wanted to point out was the 
the fact that crime as a genre was just kind of on, mm. it was just the right time as well. I think it was also good timing on Nicole's part. Um, you know, I see now, because the reason that you and I met, and Nicole, you may not know this, but the reason me and Jared met is because I was like, I think I'd watched maybe Making a Murderer on Netflix. Mm. And because I'm in the TV business, I'm always kind of going, okay, well, what's, because I often feel like when you watch TV in South Africa, it's like oh, another wedding show or another celebrity entertainment show. And it's so e it's actually quite easy to be innovative in this market because you don't see a lot of just the standard stuff. Like when, have, when do you see a gardening show, for example? But if you go to Britain and the BBC, you know, they've got gardening shows coming out of your ears with the best gardeners, most charismatic gardeners in the world. But for us, from a content perspective, we get caught in these lanes. You know, you do celebrity entertainment and then every show is on the red carpet. You do a wedding show, then everyone's doing wedding shows. You know, our broadcasters and our traditional broadcasters are not have not traditionally been innovators. I mean, we still import a, 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 a shit ton of international formats, for example, you know, which don't necessarily fit into this context. Anyway, so crime was just kind of when I when we met, it was because I was like, this, it's a no-brainer. Why is no one thinking of this? This was about five or six years, five years mm, ago now, maybe, mm. that crime is a no-brainer. We're in a country that has got, and I knew from my university days with coming across people like Bryn Hodgkiss, who had been around interviewing serial killers in the 90s as part of his research, that we had great stories, great mm, serial killers mm. and great stories. So great timing as well, I think, is, was a factor, mm. surely. Do you, do you agree or... Yeah, I think it was it was definitely um, sort of right concept at the right time, but I have to admit that that was not a conscious thing on my side. Mm. It wasn't, you know, oh, I see this gap in the market. It was more I saw what other countries were doing, similar to, to what you've just said. I saw what other countries were doing in terms of YouTube and podcast content in true crime, but for me it was more a not can I create an entertainment value it was look at how some of these podcasts overseas are actually helping to solve cases uh -huh. in a sort of ethical way you know and I thought but you know why doesn't South Africa not have something like this you know it's and it's becoming more and more frequent now we're seeing more and more uh, cases in Australia quite recently a, a very old cold case was solved um, because of coverage from podcasts. So that was a big thing for me as well, was um, definitely it, it was the right time, but I think the conscious decision from me was maybe a bit different, um, you know, around motive. Sure. So, so two questions. I mean, one based on what you've just said. The first one was, when did you kind of realize you've ha you're now successful, you know, that you know, you've really arrived in terms of the podcast? And then second, linked to what you've just said. So how many of the cases you talk about What's the rough percentage between cases that have been solved and been to court versus the unsolved? Mm. So I think I think the 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 success of the podcast has been dramatic, but it has been gradual. So it wasn't overnight. Um, you know, when I started to realize, I think that there was something to it was when, of course, journalists started contacting me, asking me, you know, could they talk about the podcast in their newspapers, um, you know. But then also when people started asking why I hadn't published an episode, that was quite a big thing for me. When people were, you know, on a Friday waiting and expecting it, like it had become part of their life, mm. you know. So I think that it's, it's been all sorts of different little milestones um, that has made me, you know, when I sit back and think about it, I think it's, it's, it's quite overwhelming and surreal how it's all happened um, I think probably one of the biggest moments for me was when we started to get and, and this links to the second half of your question is when we started to get leads in on missing people uh, missing person cases and um, a couple of the cold case murders that I've done so I split my I would say probably 80 percent of my coverage is solved cases and about 20 percent is unsolved I only do unsolved cases where it's a cold case. It's not actively being investigated. Yeah. And I determine that by speaking to family members, um, you know, if there's a private investigator on the case, 
if the original IO will speak to me. Um, so it's, it's very important to me that I don't ever cover something that's going to damage a future court case. Mm. Um, so those cases that I do are either really old, the murders that I've done are sort of 15, 20 years old, or missing person cases where all of the active leads have been run through and there's nothing more to do. Mm. And really those are the moments when we started getting those leads in. And a lot of people will contact me directly and then I'll give the info through to either the family or the investigating officer. And for me personally, because of why I started this podcast, those have been the moments that have made me really sit back and go, okay, you know, it, it's actually making a real world difference now. It, it's actually worth something. Do you ever get family members of like cold cases saying, please, will you cover our family members murder in your podcast? Because maybe that'll give some attention to the case rejuvenated. All the time, actually more than I can handle. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I've got a list of probably 10, 15 cases at the moment that I'm working on getting covered on the podcast. Um, so I think the more people hear how I handle the cases, the more people are starting and, and see and hear other victims' families speaking about how they perhaps trust me and they've trusted me with their stories, the more people are approaching me. So I'm actually getting that quite a lot. Um, I do have to be quite careful, I think, because as you'll well know, Gerard, um, family members are not always, they want to get the information out there because they want the case to be solved. Um, but as, as a, you know, the, what, doing what I'm doing, I need to make sure that I'm not just covering it because they want it covered and I'm covering it because it's actually going to help and not harm the case. Mm -hmm. What is your process for sourcing stories? Because you've done a lot now. Um, and the more you do, the harder it becomes to find original stuff and new stuff and stuff that interests you. So what is your process for, for sourcing cases? So I get a lot of suggestions. Um, but also, you know, I mean, I've got an Excel spreadsheet that's got hundreds of cases listed. Um, you know, and that comes from from suggestions from cases I spot in the media. So if there's an active, once there's an active case that's just come up, I'll log it into my Excel spreadsheet and then just, you know, add resources into there as it goes. And when it's ready to be covered, I'll cover it. Um, but it, it really has not been difficult to, you know, to find cases to cover. What makes it difficult is finding proper verified information that I feel comfortable including in the podcast. Um, that has been a bit of a challenge, you know. So there's a lot of cases, but there's not very many cases with enough information to make a 40 minute or an hour podcast mm -hmm. and to make sure that that information is actually real and accurate. Have you, um, as you know, it sounds like you're busier and busier. I mean, you know, you're writing books, you're maintaining the podcast, etc. Have you had the need to to take on board other team members to, to hire some folks? So certainly, um, yeah, I'd love to, I do have um, a couple of people who help me on the social media side, um, sort of freelance, um, you know, individuals. I have had many people who've offered to help me with research. I've got sort of a, a whole list of people who've offered to help me with research. It's just been something that I haven't gotten around to sort of disseminating yet. I am a bit of a control freak, so that does play into it. Um, but yeah, there's going to come a time where I'm going to have to hand over some of the stuff to you, to other people so that the podcast can grow. Um, because, you know, there, there will come a time where I can't do it all myself. Hmm. Um, do you have any questions from this line of questioning? No, please go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm just curious, for the for the kind of bunning podcaster out there, you've kind of learned organically as you've been going through the process of kind of growing. And so you've been – what are some of the kind of key – key bits of advice you could give to people who want to start up a podcast about important ways to kind of get some momentum with a podcast you know it's all fair and well to to create a great put of content and put it up on the internet but um you know how do you get people to listen to it what have been some of the kind of you know what advice might you have in that area mm. 
So I can only really, you know, th this not being sort of my business, um, I can only really reflect on my own journey and say, you know, point out the things that I think have made me successful. Um, I think a big part of that has been when you, you know, audience buy-in is vitally important. Podcasters, especially if it's an audio-only podcast, those people are connecting only with your voice for the most part. And they need to really connect with you as a human being. And really, for me, I think the way that I did that was by admitting that I was new to this journey, being honest about my motives, um, you know, and, and I think really reflecting who I was as a person and not trying to, the minute you try and come across as a persona rather than the human being that you actually are, there's going to come a point where you're going to slip and your audience is going to see, okay, but that's actually not who you really are, you know, and that's, that's for me has been a big part of growing my audience is, attracting the type of people who enjoy the way I think, who enjoy, you know, sharing the insights that I come up with. So that's, that's a big part of it is, it sounds a bit cheesy, but really just being yourself and just to sort of maybe an elevated version of yourself, you know, more Can professional I? version of yourself. And then just consistency. I know that that's been a huge part of it. Um, you know, just pushing yourself to get that content out there every single week and, and communicating um, so I guess yeah it's really like any other relationship just with a, a large mass of people absolutely um yeah it's interesting you raise the point about kind of finding discovering your authentic self because that's advice I always gave to I always give to tv presenters is that you know the trick is not to I I cast I cast a lady by the name of Banang for a show called, for SABC One, and Banang went on to be like our most well known TV presenter, as you will know. And um, the thing, what I realized after she's kind of when she kind of really became kind of the it girl, you kind of it lady, it woman, you realize that. Um, Everyone you audition suddenly, all the women you audition are kind of doing the banang. You know, they come with that same kind of delivery, that same kind of like there's a style you have to um, adhere to in South Africa to be successful. And um, for me, that was always an easy way to kind of to 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 eliminate people from the process because it's it's really the the one unique thing that you have is your own personality. Mm. And the more the more you can capture the essence of that and kind of be true to that you know that in itself gives you your uniqueness yeah. and that so and, and i think also that's the beauty i think of podcasts and youtube channels is you can do these things with an iphone you know you don't have to have yeah i think as you get further on you want better and better equipment but you can do these things literally on a shoestring budget um which means you can do it exactly as you want to whereas if you've got funding from people you have to do it as they want it and done in a certain way which then takes that creativity away from you and I think that's sad. Like you say, you're, you're not presenting what you really want to. And again, if you find those people that like it, they really like it. So mm. I think that's the beauty of these types of formats. Costs very little to put stuff out there. And you can do it your way because you don't have someone telling you how to do it because they, they're paying you the money mm. every month. Of course, once you do, if you get to a certain level and people want to sponsor you, that, of course, is always a risk that they're going to not want you to cover certain cases or in some way, not maliciously try and influence what you're doing. And that, I think that really then stifles it and ruins it. It is interesting to think about the kind of content space in South Africa because, you know, this is the beauty of it. If you have an interest that is fairly niche or fairly like focused on a particular group that has a particular interest, in South Africa, you can pretty much count on the fact that unless it's right in the bang of the kind of mainstream mainstream that there's not going to be much about it mm -hmm. so again it is a great i've always lo i love south africa for the reason that um you know it's a good thing and a bad thing isn't it it's it's you'd wish that there was more diversity of content that covered kind of all the potential genres that are out there but because a lot is kind of under catered to there are a lot of opportunities to kind of take an interest and make something mm. substantial out of it or do you know talk about be the become a voice for it i'm curious nicole about the relationship with times live and times and sunday times and what have you i don't know how that whole group works times live sunday times times media blah 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 i personally would never have come across your um, podcast had it only been on that on that platform because i find it very difficult to go to a website which is 
um, a newspaper and uh, within five minutes I'm stumbling across spelling errors and grammatical mistakes from other journalists because I study journalism and I'm a bit of a an elitist about it and I'm like a bit of a snob about it so I don't like I'm I, I, I personally I'm not a fan of that platform but uh, is it been success which is irrelevant but I'm just sharing because I want to and um, because I get to like you know do that and Nicole how important has that been? Because that is kind of a mainstream media platform where a lot of people kind of go daily for their badly spelt news. Um, how important were they um, were they in kind of your growth as well? So I think um, Arena Arena Holdings, um, who, who they house Times Live, Sunday Times, Sowetan Live. They contacted me about three months into the podcast. So it was very, very early on. Okay. Um, and the young lady that, that runs their podcasts, she was interested in, in what True Crime South Africa could do. And we had a chat. And it basically what has happened is sort of a, it's not a formal agreement. It's not a financial agreement. There's no contract in place. It's an agreement between the two of us that, I share my content on their platform, so on their website, they host it on their website, and then every week when I release an episode, um, I write a hopefully correctly spelt uh, article about uh, the case that I've just covered, so they give me that, that platform to, to talk about the podcast on, and yeah, that's, that's what it's been. Um, it's been beneficial as much as many of the people that have come on board to support the podcast early on has been every every single one of the organizations sponsors that has approached me have played you know sort of a little puzzle piece in the journey and um, so times live i'm certainly grateful to firstly for recognizing that early on you know three months in when i think i had five thousand total downloads you know um and, and sticking with it. And yeah, I mean, we don't know where it's going to go in the future. It is still very much just a, a handshake agreement, uh, but it's there. And of course, that's also spilled over. You, you were doing some stuff with Jack around AFM, which is of course definitely up here is wildly popular in the sort of north northeastern parts of the of the country. Mm, correct, yeah. Yeah, so there's been quite a few different, different opportunities. Jack around has been great because we've expanded the the podcast now into Afrikaans. They've taken six of the episodes, translated that into Afrikaans for that for their listeners. And that's sort of a, a trial uh, version to see how that's going to do. And if it does really well, which I think it has been, they'll then continue with that uh, going forward. So yeah, that's that's been great. Um, I must say that you know, and, and going back to the, the question about um, people wanting to start their own podcasts, monetizing is an interesting thing, um, you know, and what I found really was I've never had to approach anyone to sponsor the podcast. Mm -hmm. um, they've really all contacted me because I think they wanted to be part of what they saw the podcast was doing in, in a real world context. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think people building their own podcast, no matter what genre it's in, if they can, you know, it might be an art podcast or a music podcast. If they can create that sort of storytelling narrative where brands actually want to be part of it, you know, that's sort of, I guess, the idea. Really. I think at the end of the day, what it all comes down to is that in South Africa, when it comes to crime, we have a lot of really good stories because whether it's a podcast, whether it's a documentary, whether it's a movie, whatever it is, at the heart of every good piece of content comes a good story. Mm. If the story isn't solid, 
then um, mm-hmm. then you you you're on a losing you're on a losing um, trajectory right from the get go. Which leads me to my next question, which is just your general thoughts on the true crime space in South Africa. I mean, you know, I know Gerard, you do a lot of contributing, not only to the news, but you know, to a lot more now. We're seeing more documentary mm-hmm. series, etc. I mean, I even managed to find some funding to do some myself. You know, which which you guys have been involved with, actually, both mm-hmm. Nicole and Jared have been involved in that process, um, and hopefully, it will be something which is the stepping stone to bigger budgets and bigger opportunities, because <laughs> that is still the challenge in South Africa is working with these quite restrictive budgets. But then. I also think that where there is budget, I personally, thus far, when it comes to, let's take your kind of mainstream or your kind of your streaming platform kind of series. We've seen Devil's Dorp. We've seen the Senzo documentaries. Mm, mm. I still feel like just a, yeah, the Krugersdorp case is interesting, but not the most, when I, being aware of the true crime landscape and all the stories that are out there, the Stuart Vulcans of the world, to me, they are, We've still not really gotten near the really good stories, you know. Mm. Um, Devil's Dorp had nothing to do with the devil. So it's a bit like weird from the get-go. And, um, um, you know, it was just some weird cult lady, wasn't it? Some some manipulative psychopath lady. There was no... So again, and it's also catering to that kind of more smaller, can I say a white audience in South Africa? It's a bit more of a niche target market. It's not the mass, you know. It's not... Um, it's not black crime, for example, which may resonate culturally more with a larger portion of the population. And then when you do see shows that are targeted at that audience, you see something like the Senzo documentary. Now, for me, that's like I know people who are content um, commissioners and I know what their thought process is like. And they go like, OK, we're going to make a crime series for black people in South Africa. Well, let's see what boxes do we need to tick. Uh, soccer. And a, and a famous pop star. Okay, great. That's the story we're going for. Whereas if you're actually aware of the whole case and what's going on and the fact that it's still going on, and it's, it's not really that TV friendly. It's not really a co- great companion case. You know, I don't feel like we're s- seeing stuff where it's like the story is leading the decision making. Mm. You know, what, what, just what are your thoughts, Jerry, Nicole? What are your thoughts on, and you don't have to agree with me, you could love Devil's Door. Please, I want you to if you do. So I think... <laughs> I think the true crime space in South Africa is, I think it's always been there to a certain extent. So, I mean, that goes back to the sort of years of Benjamin Bennett, you know, the sort of first true crime, real true crime also. It's, I think it's going through growth and with that comes teething pains. With that comes the establishment of what are we creating and who are we creating it for? And if we look at the more established markets like the UK and the US, that sort of dichotomy between creating the OJ Simpson stuff and creating the content that actually, you know, means something and has more substance behind it, that still exists in the US as well. Um, So I don't know that we're ever going to, you know, dodge that hurdle. It's, I think it's going to be pretty much the same evolution for us in the true crime community here. Uh, you know, there are going to be creators who create for sensation, and there are going to be creators who create perhaps with a more noble motive behind it. And yes, the true crime genre is always going to be entertainment. Um, you know, it's, for me, it's going to be How far are you going to go for entertainment? And are you going to sell out on not telling the less famous but more interesting stories um, because you're worried you might not get eyes or clicks or views? Mm. Um, But I'm quite excited about where we're going, you know, in in the true crime um, genre in South Africa. And I'm quite excited to be sort of with the pack that's, you know, running, you know, running in front because the more that creators like us who I think are on the more ethical side are setting the pathway and, you know, putting down those guide stones for people that are kind of going to come after us, we can almost create 
what we want the genre to be in our country. The earliest kind of, I'm not sure there could have been earlier, you know, true crime book that, that I think is like what we do, the type of stuff we're doing that I've come across. And I really just came across this guy's name when I was looking in the comments and someone else's local YouTube mm. true crime you know, show was called the 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 Boerberg story, B O B E R G. Yeah, and I'd never heard of this guy, but this guy was a colonel, was the head of South African detectives. I mean, he, the book came out in 1957, so I think he was. You know, I, some of the cases he talks about was during World War II. Mm. He talks about he came to you know his parents. I think him and his dad and his brother fled. Must have been during World War One. And he came to South Africa as a child who couldn't speak English. Long story short, he ends up becoming a cop and he ends up becoming South Africa's top detective, kind of like the, the Pete Baylor felt back in the 40s. Mm. And he also talks about, in a very similar to my book, the first chapter is like about his life and his background, how he ended up. And then he has also, also has about 10 of his most interesting cases, including the Oppenheimer jewelry theft case. So some, and and then that the first sort of real big serial killer case we had here, which was in Johannesburg, where sex workers were being murdered. And I read this book, I got hold of a copy, because I think they had like one print run in 57 and not again. And you can still, if you're lucky, get some, you know, it's an English and an Afrikaans version. And I bought up a couple because I thought this is so, that it was absolutely so amazing. It's probably the most phenomenal local true crime thing I've ever read. The Bo Boerberg story, and I think Afrikaans is called Boerberg, Boerberg Vertel, Boberg okay. Tells. And it's phenomenal to see how the, the, the principles of policing, you know, to be that good cop, you have to think smart and do the basics. Because they didn't have DNA, they didn't have cell phone stuff. And how he was catching people and the initiative and the, you know, hey, I've got a problem. How am I going to overcome this? And taking bones like in his car up to Johannesburg to get them analyzed by some, it was phenomenal. So, and it's amazing, it just shows you, and this was wildly popular back in those days. And like I said, there are still copies floating around if you can get them. And if you like true crime, I'd love to see someone put this into like a dr dramatized series. Mm. Uh, just because it's the times to hear about, they talk about places in Johannesburg that I drive past regularly. And like that was a, a plantation in those, like Melrose was a plantation, Bird Haven was a plantation. It's phenomenal. But again, it just goes to show you, I mean, this is the point, isn't it? I mean, crime is what we're talking about as a genre but there is so much of the landscape that is un, 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 uh, unfarmed, yeah, you know? Um, and so, so the opportunities are vast to create cool, interesting stuff. Um, what I find interesting is that at the moment, we've been trying to get a, a documentary about Oscar Pistorius off the ground, which is a, a take on the Oscar story, which hasn't really been covered in depth. And it's simply two things. And it's kind of with Gerard as a centerpiece of the story where it is because Gerard was with Oscar on the day and kind of has an insight into his behavior. I mean, who who, who better do you want to be with Oscar on the day to kind of just evaluate from, from as an observer um, kind of what's going on with him and then to be able to apply all of your professorship and all of your knowledge and all of your experience to what you're seeing and then to interpret that into a narrative. And so that's kind of the root of the story is kind of like a profile on Oscar in the context of him being released next year. So what are we really releasing back into public when he goes out or when he gets out on parole? Um, and then within the story of that, also unpacking kind of the structure of the investigation and how it's kind of compromised by the more and more kind of corrupt history of the police and how it influenced all the different you know different investigative teams on the crime scene during the day so coming at the my point is that coming at that story from a different angle in knowing that yeah sure there's recently there's the isla um uh, my name is Reva documentary. So there are documentaries on the subject in the space. My point is this, is that the feedback we've been getting, and we only try to do stuff for the international market so we don't have to deal with local media houses because, uh, you, you know, we've talked about that. I've talked about that already. But um, um, only if the, and the feedback is like a bit like, oh, no, you know, it's kind of been done and Oscar's been done. But my point is, it, you know, they, there's not enough Jeffrey Dahmer documentaries, are there? I mean, you know, they bring out the five millionth Jeffrey Dahmer story, and it's the second biggest show in history on Netflix. So they can do their crime stories and their serial killers a million times. You know what I mean? You can have fifth. How many Ted Bundy documentaries have you seen? How many, you know, the whole the, the kind of pantheon of, of American serial killers? It's like, okay, this documentary series focuses the 
you know, the the cleaning lady of of Ted Bundy's flat when he was a teenager, and that's and that, this is a whole documentary series on her perspective. You know what I mean? They'll find every and any angle. But in South Africa, you know, I, I, I was talking about uh, uh, the potential of a documentary on the Vota Basson story, and there was a documentary made, I think, in two thousand and one or something. You know, still shot in four eighty p, kind of not sixty mile. You know, so old. There's this sentiment that once you've done it once in South Africa, it's done. It's done. And heaven forbid anyone ever tried to tell that story again or from another perspective or in higher definition or whatever. Thoughts? Sorry, after my rant. Why, why can't we tell our story? Why are our stories not... You know, if you've heard the Ted Bundy story 20 times, surely that's less interesting than hearing the Stuart Wilkins story first for the yeah. first time. Surely. So I think, you know, maybe we're, we're putting those limits on ourselves. Um, you know, I think that there was a lot of backlash on, um, you know, after the most recent Reva documentary was released. But there's always going to be that backlash. There's always going to be those people saying, but what about, you know, what about this one? And what about that one? And why are we focusing on this? And, you know, the same thing has happened with the book I've just done. Um, you know, why are we telling this story again? You know, it's it's up to to the people that are creating the content, whether it's a book or a podcast or a documentary or whatever it is, to, you know, if you feel that you've got a real aspect of the story to tell that needs to be told and there's going to be value in telling it, then tell it. Because, you know, there's always going to be people who are going to say, oh, you're just, you know, riding on the wave or whatever the case may be. Um I think as a continent, you know, there's, we, we also need to know that for a long time, the African continent has not been allowed to tell their own stories. Mm -hmm. We've had our stories told for us. Um, you know, so really what's quite exciting for me about, about podcasting in particular, and it being something you can do independently with no one's permission, yeah. is we're now allowed to give our you know we've been we've been given ourselves permission to tell our own story yeah. um, and that goes for everyone across the continent yeah i guess that's the power of the podcast is you can be you have that editorial control and it's wonderful but i can tell you when you come up against still the kind of mainstream the decision makers in the mainstream space who are selecting content i just don't feel like that there 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 is still a level of, okay, thanks for the great ideas, South African production industry. We appreciate it. Love that idea. Now, here is the um, the uh, creative executive from London who will be overseeing the project and basically Wakandifying it enough so it's palatable for the rest of the world. Because again, you know, you talk about us being empowered to tell African stories. I think we can do that in the podcast space where it becomes more difficult in the more mainstream media space, your more traditional media platforms is that you are, there is still that thing of, okay, we're going to do a Netflix series and King Engelbrecht is going to be the star on the posters in South Africa. But just so you know, the second actor on the show is some some B-grade dude from who was in four episodes of Game of Thrones, and he's going to be on the posters in the UK, okay, when we promote it there. Because South Africans, you're still not good enough to really be making all the decisions. Everything has to go through our kind of British or American filter, again, so that it's so that it's Wakanda enough to be acceptable. We don't really want to deal with the real South Africa. And then another challenge we come up with in South Africa is that South Africans are still on that thing of, oh, no, we can't tell negative stories. Everything has to be positive. Heaven forbid we talk about the negative things and show ourselves in a bad light. Well, the time is coming to show ourselves in a bad light, which I want to talk about a bit. But first, Nicole, moving on from this conversation, what led you to the book and why that story? Seeing as we're talking about it, why did you pick that particular story? And tell us, tell us about the book. Sorry, just introduce the book and tell us about why you selected it. Will do. So, uh, Samurai Sword Murder, the Mornay Hanamsa story that was published in, just been published in October. It was written as a result of a few interesting coincidences, a um, few happy coincidences, but essentially in the beginning of the year, in March, when, when Monet was released on parole and his, his case sort of came back into the media spotlight and there were lots of rumours and 
uh, assumptions made about it again. I started doing some research into doing a an update episode on the podcast uh, where I chatted to, I'd connected with Jacques Pretorius, who's the victim in the case. I'd connected with his aunt in 2019 during the first parole hearing. So I had, um, I had heard that I could interview and I was just going to do an update episode on the podcast. And then at the same time, uh, Melinda Ferguson, who is um, of Melinda Ferguson Books, an imprint of indie publishers, she had decided that she thought that there was a book in this case. And she was researching. She came across the first podcast episode I did on this case. And she contacted me and asked me if I wanted to write the book. So with a lot of that research already having been done for this update episode I had planned, that's sort of how it came to be. But I think the reason that this case needed a book and why it made such a, a good book, you know, a good, good case for that storytelling format was because of all the different little aspects in it. So there's so many rabbit holes. You know, and for me, I really don't think the truth was ever, it was told, but it was masked by so many other things. And I think that was an important part of writing this book was unmasking, you know, pushing away all the, 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 the fluffy stuff, the Satanism, the slipknot and all of that nonsense and getting down the, to the root of what really happened. Because for me, that truth serves the victims in the case far better than, you know, this mask that's been worn across this case for so long. Mm -hmm. And it's important to get down to that layer of the story because that's the, the kind of those, what, what people might consider to be the hook, the main hooks, like you just said, like the, you know, the devil part, et cetera, those things that really seem to resonate with the local audience. Like you said, those are the surf, that's the surface level interest. When you go deeper, that's where you find the really good meaty stuff. How do you feel about him having been paroled? So I'm not by any stretch of the imagination an expert, so I can only take, you know, sort of my... My feeling about it is that it was not a good decision for Mornay himself or for the for his community. Uh, it wasn't the right time. He had not done what he needed to do. And I, I don't think it was a, a great, well thought out decision. Hmm. Look, after years of being in this subject matter and in this space, I think you can call yourself somewhat of an expert. I mean, I like to think, Jared. When did somebody become an expert, Jared? When when did you become an expert? How long did it take? <laughs> was it like mid-interview with Kurbis Heldenheis, or was it, you know, once you'd been hired by the I, Popo? I always say it's when someone else calls you an expert that you might be one. <laughs> oh, is that? <laughs> there you go. Well, well, we're calling Nicole an expert, so she's now Absolutely. officially you're an expert, Nicole. I mean, you've been in this space long enough, and interestingly, you have you know when you come at it from a journalistic point of view, you're you're coming at it from a multitude of different angles and getting to kind of absorb and take in the whole bigger picture. Whereas people who are in law enforcement tend to kind of focus and stay in their lane a lot. You know, if you're especially if you're in, in a particular discipline in the system you know um how has the book been doing it's it's been doing very well it's been very well received um i think the most important comment for me was from um, jacques Pretorius's aunt leone attended my clearwater launch and i gave her a copy of the the book there a signed copy she read it in, in just a couple of days and sent me a message um, on behalf of her and the Pretorius family, thanking me for writing the book and saying that they were very happy with the way I told the story and how I represented Jacques and that they felt that they really got quite a bit of information that they needed to answer some questions. So, um, yeah, that's, that was a very important part of that for me. And then it's, you know, the numbers wise, it's been doing well in the, in the top sellers lists and it's been selling well and all of that. So it's, it's, it's been received well so far. Where's the easiest place to pick up, pick up a copy? Uh, any good bookstore, as they say. So Exclusive Books has been great in supporting me. Uh, I know Bargain Books has got a lot of stock, uh, Take a Lot. 
Uh, it is on Amazon as well, the ebook, and then my audio book will be out, yes, narrated by me, oh, will nice. be out in the next, right. uh, hopefully, couple of weeks. Well, l l guys, now we have, I, I'm, I'm officially, officially announcing a litmus test. If you go to a bookstore and you don't find Nicole's book, you have my permission to tell the person at the counter that their bookstore is rubbish. Okay, because only good bookstores have it. Jo your Gerard's book too. Only good bookstores yeah. have Gerard's book. So if you can't find Gerard's or Nicole's book, then just go up to the person at the desk and say, "Just want to let you know your store's rubbish." Um, yeah. And I mean, I was uh, fortunate <laughs> enough. I came as a as a, as an audience member to your Clearwater one, and it was it was phenomenally attended. And I mean, really, people really really liked the book and were keen, excited to meet you. And depending when this podcast comes out, are you doing one in Pretoria? Uh, is it the 19th of November? Mm. This yes. podcast will be uh, up by 19th yeah. of November at uh, 4 in the afternoon at Brooklyn, uh, exclusive Brooks Brooklyn, with a very special interviewer. Wow. Very excited wow. to hear who that could be. Hey, I wonder. <laughs> you guys aren't giving us any clues. So I will be How cryptic. Day, sure. Okay, Gerard. <laughs> we got it. Our audience are true crime fans, okay? They they put A plus B equals C right there. But you know, you thanks for the C. <laughs> um, the next thing I want to ask about: um, Do you have any more questions on Nicole's book? Well, I think go read it. I mean, obviously, you don't want to cover too much, then people don't want to read it. But I think amazing topic. I mean, I I, I did a chapter of this on my last book, and because it was, for me it was absolutely probably one of the most fat, fascinating cases that I didn't realize actually back then how fascinating it was. And it was only until I got into the world of threat assessment and preventative, you know, threat assessment, trying to stop things from happening that I actually realized, wow, this actually is, it's, if he had a gun in his hand, this would have been the same as the American school shootings in terms of his mindset, his philosophy. So it's only really real years later that I realized actually, wow, how much of a, an amazing topic this case this is. And like you say, Nicole, not for the reasons that everybody else you know, the Satan, the Slipknot stuff, but the, the actual true backstory, which is, is just as phenomenal and interesting. So worth it. My, my, one of the points I often make about local crime content is the fact that the context alone makes a lot of stories interesting or gives a lot of layers of interest to a story. Like, for example, I always use the example of if prostitutes start turning up murdered. If a, like you say, if a prostitute starts turning up, a bunch of prostitutes start turning up and murdered in South Africa, the the case recently in Johannesburg being slightly off canter um, or not typical, but then you can pretty much assume that it's a white male. So just little things like that, which are unique to South Africa. This is the reason I feel like there's such a good future for crime content globally and for to capture a bigger audience is because not only are you learning about an are you hearing about a, a, an interesting case that has all of that kind of macabre interest value that a majority female audience seems to enjoy because you know true crime audiences mm. are majority female typically, but um, then you're all, you're also getting a, a fresh cultural social perspective kind of built into that story a perspective that you don't know africa is not wakanda africa is not sarafina you know where even in struggle everyone's singing and dancing you know what i mean africa has a unique cultural social context that is still extremely unknown in the rest of the world. And I think when people cotton on to the fact that there's also that layer of interest and that's a part of the power and strength of our content is sharing the perspective of South Africans mm. and South Africa, then I think, um, you know, it'll just help local crime go from strength mm. to strength. My next question is, Nicole, just about the crime landscape, because as I've become more and more involved in making crime content and exploring the crime world and meeting everyone from Gerards to detectives to to um, prosecutors, you know, all of the various, both within the police and ex-police or what have you, I find it extremely hard not to be like, I hate to, I'm going to, Amy, we're going to beep this, but be like, South Africa is fucked. You know what I mean? Excuse my language. But, but you know, things are not getting better when it comes to law enforcement. How do you manage kind of just your own personal mental health and thinking about, do you find that? Do you find what I'm finding where it's like, I, it's way worse than I realized, man. I thought I knew it was bad and the statistics are bad every year, but it seems to be much worse. Mm. 
yeah it is it's it is it can be very sort of disheartening um i do i do think i think that i I've, I've i can approach this from one of two two ways when i came into this i actually had a far worse view of the police than i have now okay and but not the police as an organization police police officers as human beings mm. um so i think what tempers my my disheartenment at the organizational level is meeting and understanding and seeing how actual human beings who are doing these jobs every single day and not just in uh, as police officers but in you know all sorts of law enforcement fields dna activism all of that sort of things how those individuals still exist and if they're the ones going into these jobs every single day and they're still putting their all into it you know do i really have the right to sit behind my microphone and say oh well it's all stuffed you know because they're still doing the job every single day but there are less and less of them every day i kind of agree with you nicole i look at this i look at it in two ways i to me there are two police in my mind there's the guys who are good at what they do who care about what they do who get up every morning have the right kind of are programmed the right way to be a police officer and they are incredible albeit you cannot deny the fact that they're pretty much draining out of the police at a rate of knots it seems so that expertise at every level is draining out of the police which is disheartening um um but then the other part that i look at like you say is the organization is the management obviously that level that layer has become so it's it is corrupted to the core it seems you know and and, and, yeah. s- and the organization is so top heavy when you look at the salary bill that goes to the senior you know like the police a huge chunk of the police budget goes to this in massively inflated senior management where there are way too many people at that level there's nowhere near enough attention paid to the average cop on the beat um yeah and and, and so so i hear you on the two layers but the, you can't deny that even where there is good and the good is the best i mean gerard in my opinion must be the most experienced profiler in the world you know who's caught serial killers thinks about them has all the academic qualifications and has tens and tens and tens and tens of cases as experience so you're right we have the best people but it's being drained out of the so i i find it very hard to maintain a level of optimism doing this stuff and i tell myself well i'm making crime content so the more crime the better for me personally <laughs> you know what i mean and i try to make kind of give myself a bit of peace with that thought but it doesn't really help with my kind of my the caring for society part of me you know I was told last week that something I didn't know the biggest chunk of police budget goes to the VIP protection services to that unit. I mean and to me that is extremely telling. It kind of like speaks a thousand words. Gerard, you're very quiet. Gerard, you're being very quiet on this point. You're an ex-cop. You were there. Mm-hmm. I'm curious about your kind of un- slightly uncensored thoughts on this subject matter, I, as I uncensored that, as you're willing to be. Yeah, you know, look, I think it pretty much echoes with what both of you said. Um you know, it's a case, do you split the individual versus the organization? And I mean, I always say if, if Toyota, just as a the, uh, just for argument's sake, Toyota, I mean, brilliant brand, but if Toyota made a thousand cars a year and 10 of them like were brilliant, they never broke down, they went on f- for, you know, a million kilometers, no problems. Uh, but the other, you know, 990 are terrible or useless. What are you going to say about Toyota as a brand? So SAPS's brand as a brand, is, is terrible. It's it's just it's destroyed, mm. uh, and that does have a lot to do with uh, you know lack of good management. Because you know, I always say that you can have mediocre people, but if they have that detective commander who looks at their dockets, inspects it every week, and gives them written instructions in the docket, even if that detective doesn't think the instructions from that commander who's smart to that captain 
who knows who's been a captain of detective cases, working on cases for 20, 25 years, that investigation would be done relatively well. Also, you'd like to think that from those instructions, the person would learn and grow that mentoring. Um, but we've kind of like decimated from, as Nicole pointed out, the, the top levels. I mean, we've got pre-94, I think someone once said we had like nine generals in the whole of South African police. We have a few hundred generals now. Exactly. I mean, I think and the British what's military... What's the salary? The salary cap ridiculous. for these people is huge. They get paid a it's fortune. Millions. Um, and then, you know, and someone then compared it to like at the end of World War II, the British military had less generals at the end of a war than we have right mm. now. So it's just that, the, 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 and obviously the controversies with the national commissioners that just don't ever finish their terms because of some controversy. Then we have ministers who just say really strange things sometimes. Um, I, I think that top level will always have influence on the people down. In, in, in morale, mainly more directly, but your direct commander, if they're not good, they're not, we're not grooming the next generation of really, even if the most motivated constable who joins the police, if he's not being mentored by someone who is good, it doesn't matter that he's been on a, a fantastic detective course. That's the first little step. The rest is when you become a good detective is what you learn when you're on the, back, in the streets working as a detective. And yo, and I think we, 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 it's good and right to praise the people that are all there and still work in the backsides off to do a good job. But those are not getting more. We aren't replacing the ones that are leaving through retirement or retrenchment, no, not retrenchment, but like resignation, et cetera. And that's, that really does become very, very, I mean, I was just talking this morning on a radio interview about the, the SAPS's counterterrorism investigations. You know, the people investigating the ISIS and the right wing guys here in the country are doing wacky stuff brilliant, amazingly experienced policemen historically and also been doing this work for like 20, 25 years working on counterterrorism stuff. There's about 10 of them at the national office yeah. and the majority of them are going to be either are going to be retiring in the next few years. And yeah. there is, they're not, and SAPS has always had this problem. They don't think about succession planning. They're not grooming the next, they should have 20 new guys with talent that they've identified and grooming them. Yeah. working under these guys to learn as much as possible. Because when these guys go, what SAPS is like, oh, we've got nobody now. Hey, let's just appoint five new people in this unit. You know, so, But it's not just about that. It's about people's experience, their training. Yeah. You can't just take, I want to say, a zero experienced person, put them in a specialist environment and expect to have the same outcome. It's like, yeah, exactly. It's yeah, not that. just warm bodies in positions. It's institutional knowledge, it's experience, training. And you lose that, you've lost pretty much everything. And instead of that person... Still being within the police, it's now you now got a general, another general. <laughs> this is the problem. I mean, there's not even enough dogs in the police. I learned a few weeks ago. You know, we're like there's not, there's only like a third of the required police dog quota. I mean, we can't even get enough dogs. The dogs we have again are the best dogs in the world. You know, they can sniff out like the craziest stuff. They can apparently be on a boat on a lake, in the middle of the lake, and sniff where and they'll tell you to stop the boat because there's a we'll body down at the bottom of the ocean bottom of the lake here i mean that's how good our dogs are but i mean even them there's not enough of um it's, it's look as content creators i think i personally think the onus is on us to talk about some of these things but not to hop on about them too much because it you know it's actually a monday that we're recording this episode and it's a terrible way to start the week getting depressed about the police save that for, i save that for tuesdays um what's next for you nicole like what's on your like what's on your radar have you got the next book planned have you you know what's your trajectory in the in the medium term so I am working on uh, Melinda Ferguson and I have decided on the topic for the next book. I am in the process of researching that and so that's that's ongoing. Um, I am also working, you mentioned, is. sorry, say again? Are we allowed to ask what that book is about? Mm, so I'll be very general. Um, it is about a ongoing case the guy that has recently been found guilty of a string of pretty horrendous crimes in the western cape mm -hmm. and it's a case uh, he's, he's, he's awaiting sentence now and the the case is is horrific but it's going to really highlight parole failings okay. um, because this individual has been he's a career criminal has been in and out of jail somewhere between 12 and 16 times in his lifetime before he committed what most people would consider the ultimate crime of killing a child in 2020. Sure. So, yeah, so that's, that's going to be an interesting one. Somebody will, some listener will put this together. Mm. So, yeah, no, no, <laughs> the no, answer is no, 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 Jared. The answer was no, by the way, earlier. Nicole, you could have just said no. I'm not telling you. 
mind. I don't mind at all. That sounds awesome. Look, um, anything that highlights these, I love the fact when you do so, I love stories that highlight these kinds of flaws and weaknesses, you know, because that is one, another one. I mean, we haven't really had much luck with correctional services as far as kind of accessing them and having a good conversation with them. Um, it's very interesting how the different law enforcement organizations, some of them seem to be so separate from one another. I never realized that if you sentence and go to prison, that chances are your docket won't make its way to the prison. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so people, they don't really know where you're there. So then you add 25 years of a life sentence, plus the kind of drainage of, of intelligence from the police. And you know, by the time you reach 25 years, it's very unlikely that anyone that was involved in your case is still in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the system and still a part of the process. So you know, then again, the prison may not even know why you're there in the first place, you know, officially. Um, so the parole system just seems to be kind of a tick box that you have to just, you know, the guys administering it just need to tick certain boxes and then they'll let people out, regardless of whether somebody like Gerard thinks this is a person that is um, safe and appropriate to be put back into yeah. society. So it's very relevant, like with the Munay Haram as a case. So yes. I fully support that if it's got to do with parole and how life parole's blunders, you have my absolute support and blessing in this story. So uh, yeah, that'll be great. I mean, obviously it's a podcast, so it's a, it's a audio format. But I mean, do you find now with your more attention, I guess you could say celebrity status, do you ever get recognized when you're walking around? Um, so not, not visually yet, thankfully. Um, people do sometimes recognize my name. So I've had, I had a really weird uh, instance in a pharmacy where I walked in and gave the pharmacist my prescription. And at the time, I'd, I'd made up one little true crime South Africa mask that I was wearing. It was still in mask wearing times. And I was wearing my true crime South Africa mask. And the pharmacist looked at the script. He looked at my name, looked up at me, and he goes, um, do you also like the true crime South Africa podcast? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, he's going to put this together. So I'm like, hmm. Actually, it is my podcast. And he, he totally, yeah, he freaked out and started shouting to the whole chemist who I was. Um, but that's been a rare situation. Um, you know, I think it's, it's sort of segregated to a very small group of people at the moment, thankfully. <laughs> you, Gerard, what about you? I'm getting mobbed in the street by... You know, like before I left the police, I think only once that I recall, I was at the DVD store, so it shows you how long ago that was. One of the guys, my local one that I go to all the time, the guy says, uh, aren't you that guy, that profiler? Um, after I left, I think actually the one that really got a lot of people sort of, because I don't think people often, you know, if you're on the news last night and, and you walk past someone tomorrow, they're not going to recognize. Hmm. But that uh, the Afrikaans, he's going uh, True life, what Bada uh, Levens dramas. Yes. I mean, the Afrikaans viewers have, are a loyal following. Mm. So when I was in Pretoria, so I, I moved out of Pretoria a couple of years ago. So whenever I'd be back in Pretoria, I just like to the, going to the shops or something. I've had quite a few times in Pretoria where I'd be sitting in the cabin a meal or something or a coffee and, are you that guy? <laughs> so that, but Pretoria, yes. Oh, and once <laughs> I went on a Tinder date and um, at a restaurant and I'm sitting down with this, this young lady that I'm meeting for the first time. And I see this couple walk in and they're kind of being seated and the waitress is bringing them near to where we're sitting. And the lady peels off and she says, I don't mean to interrupt your date, but um, are you that guy with that TV show? And I'm like, it was on my show, but uh, yes. So afterwards, the date looks at me and goes, did you, did you orchestrate this? Who, <laughs> what do you do? And so that's the only time. So thank you. I find that I find like these things very uncomfortable. Like I, the book signings are incredibly anxiety provoking for me because I, I, I just, I don't, I don't know. I I just I just find that kind of public um, acknowledgement just feels weird, and I don't feel like I deserve it. Um, so that's why mm. I find the book signing. My biggest fear is like nobody's going to put you up at a book signing because <laughs> you know it's just I don't know. I'm yeah. sorry. I just wanted to pop in there with Gerard saying that he doesn't really feel you know the the, the public events are anxiety inducing. He doesn't really feel he deserves it. Now I I feel exactly the same way. It's it's such a and and I think I have more reason to feel that way because really if you think about what is happening is people I'm, I'm I could be anyone I'm just this person who was a sales manager three years ago that has gained this knowledge and done these things and you know people are sort of 
assigning this value to, this is how it feels you know they're assigning this value to me and what I've done that is only really the value that exists in their own mind mm -hmm. I mean you at least have qualifications and all of these things and you've actually done things to earn that you know book signing or whatever it may be um so yeah i get that but i, I do think that that you deserve it far more than most no but nicole i mean i i hear you jared does deserve to be kind of well known all over the world for what he does definitely because you're the best in the whole world i'm telling you but um Nicole, you for the same. I mean, you know, you are you, you the notoriety you are acquiring as you go through this journey is because you are doing stuff of substance. You are doing the it's the traditional way to get famous kind of thing, you know, by actually contributing something to the world that is more than a TikTok dance routine, you know. The modern way of of getting notoriety is by like I don't know, Kardashian doing style. a poll on a, yeah, exactly, like, exactly, Kardashian style, bringing out a sex I'll, tape. I'll or take something. that, okay. So, yeah, you must, uh, you must appreciate <laughs> your journey, and you that. should, you should value, though, no, you've earned it, you know, you've earned that notoriety, and, um, and it's nice to, yeah, you just, you've earned it, so, so don't, mm. you know, you shouldn't be, you both earned it. I'm no, the only I'm one. Who I'm I haven't earned it. I'm, I'm very grateful. Any notoriety I have is kind of like is scorned by people. They're like, well, <laughs> I love the podcast. Can we just have Gerard talk to himself for, two, for an hour <laughs> once a week? <laughs> That's my feedback. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, all right. Well, this was a lovely chat. I mean, we chatted for a long time. We've been chatting for an hour and 20 minutes, an hour and 15, an hour and 20 minutes. So this was a good one. Um, it's so nice to chat to you, Nicole. Maybe we'll do this again and we'll talk about a specific case that is in, of interest to, to us all. Um, um, obviously, we'll keep track of how things are going books-wise. So whenever there are books, we must always talk about new books. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's just been great to chat. I've been wanting to do this. We're going to be having a lot more guests on the podcast now that we've kind of sorted out our zoom solution here our remote guest solution um yeah and it's just i would just like to say it's i find it great to be a part of the crime um community the true crime content community in south africa and um, i appreciate both of you guys so much i really do nicole i think what you've done to kind of just lay the groundwork for people doing true crime content in south africa um as a mentor and somebody to look up to and aspire to is wonderful mm. and gerard you're just cool man Thanks. Because you dig Star Wars like I do. It's <laughs> a good reason. That's a good reason. Final thoughts, Nicole. This is where you now compliment no, it's, us it's just, on being awesome. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, the other day when I was, you know, I do listen to your podcast regularly, believe it or not. I have it in my, my feed. And it was a bit of a trip to be listening and, and suddenly hear you guys talking about me. And I'm like, oh, that's my name. <laughs> So that was pretty cool. It's it's been awesome chatting to both of you. I have huge respect for both of you, and um, yeah, that's it's been great. I know I'd love to to see Profiler doing Profiler Africa doing better and better. And I think the future is bright for the podcast. Absolutely. Oh, Nicole, just do us a favor. Just for the, I mean, anyone that listens to our podcast knows where your podcast is and is no doubt a listener. But just where, where, where's the best place to catch catch the podcast, etc. Just remind everybody. Sure. So available on any anywhere where you listen to podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and also on the TrueCrimeSouthAfrica.com dot com website. Fantastic. Gerard, thank you so much. Nicole, thank you so much. It's been such a lovely chat. Um, yeah, and I hope we do this again sometime. Absolutely. Okay. Good night, everybody. Absolutely. Thank you for listening. Absolutely.